Well, there are kind of two main themes that I went into the design process and rehearsals uh, interested in. The first is the, uh, the ghost story aspect of it. I guess it started with the, the challenge of being outside when it's still light out, and I was thinking, oh, that's, that's going to be interesting, because <laughs> you think of ghost stories needing to happen in the dark, but then also I thought, well, it is Scandinavia, and that, <laughs> that is a land where it's light at midnight in the summers. And I've been there, so I have a feeling for You've it. You've been to Elsinore, right? You've I've been, been to Elsinore, yeah, yeah. Research trip, right? Yeah well, yeah, well, I'm a Peterson, and actually this was probably 25 years ago, I went on a sort of roots journey um, to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And I had a little pup tent with me, and I camped at a campground on the coast of Denmark, right near, I mean, Elsinore is basically an island the size of the castle. And you walk to it over a little, uh, uh, just a little, over a little footbridge. And um, I forget the name of the town that's right there. But anyway, I camped that night. Oh, it was awful. I, it was raining very hard. Uh, I had walked around the campsite and befriended two Danish, nice Danish people who we didn't speak each other's language at all. They kept plying me with homemade apple wine. Somehow I understood that it was homemade. And I got so wasted and sick. And then as I walked over the bridge the next morning, hungover and still damp, I twisted my ankle badly. Badly. So I like hobbled around Elsinore. But anyway, I always thought, well, someday maybe I'll do Hamlet and I'll remember this. I'll remember everything about it. I'll remember. <laughs> the lightness of it and the, the feeling of the castle. There are elements in the set that come from my experience. I mean, we're outside so we don't have total control over the look of, of the play. As you know, you're always in a balancing act with the Tudor facade. But if you look, so one aspect uh, of the play is this kind of like Scandinavian ghost story. So it, just, just as an you know, insider tip in terms of the set design, there is in the below all the way uh, so th across behind the, the inner below, what I call the pine wall. And that light colored pine wall is kind of inspired by my roots journey <laughs> to Denmark. Um, but anyway, it was really interesting to start to think about, well, how do you do a ghost story? What are, what are the things that are scary when the lights are on? So we, uh, in, in, in the whole first act of Hamlet is all about the dead speak to us. They pierce the membrane and they come and they show up when they want to, when they have something to say and not everybody can see them and they seem to have control at times of their, you know, who can see them and who can't and the, the whole idea, I mean, so, so that it links to me also, of course, this is a story about a young man whose father has just died. And um, as it happens, my father just died right before Christmas. Um, so it's, it, 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 I feel it very personally, this story. And I feel like the, the, the question that, ha that, that drives Hamlet is what happens after you die? And the fact that his father shows up only confuses him more because he can't tell if, the, if his father, his father says, I'm in purgatory and I'm, I, I'm not supposed to talk to you. I'm, I have to go back. But it doesn't make sense to Hamlet like, that his father isn't in heaven is confusing and, and purgatory isn't supposed to exist for the Lutherans. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so there's the ghost story aspect. So you'll see, I don't want to tell you too much about it, but, but a lot of what happens at the top of the, of the production is our, you know, examination of of the ghost and the ghost and the and the the way that you can have a ghost story happen in the light. And of course, it has a lot to do with sound, and it also has to do with misdirection and things that seem to happen uh, without explanation. Um, sometimes it has to do with fire. It has to do with like a sword leaving somebody's hand, uh, not of their own volition. 
that kind of thing. Um, the other theme that I, that I was really interested in from the beginning, like so a year ago, looking at the play, was the sort of generational divide. So I have seen Hamlet many, many times, um, but I've never, so when I read it, I thought this is, what's really ringing out to me is that you, just like with Romeo and Juliet and many other of Shakespeare plays, I think Hamlet is very much about, you know, the, the generations and a gulf between them. And you could look at Hamlet as being, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a play about inheritance and inheriting a world and a feeling like something's rotten in that world. And there are, there are sort of, there's the generation of Hamlet's father, and that includes Claudius, Gertrude, Polonius, maybe Polonius's children. I mean, it's more of a, thing, a, a, mental, a mental age thing. It's not so much literal age to me. It's more about you know, old guard, new guard. So there's, so there's the, 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 the people in, in charge, and then there is the, the uh, younger generation, or the, the new guard, the ones who are supposed to inherit the world. And they're pissed off. I mean, even before the play starts, you've got Hamlet, uh, uh, you know, Laertes. In, in my production, Ophelia is a good girl who has a naughty streak. And that's why she's having this romance with Hamlet. She's not supposed to have it. Her father isn't supposed to know about it. Her, her brother isn't supposed to know about it. But they've been caught. And uh, uh, so she's kind of on the line between old guard, new guard. Laertes is kind of, he's new guard, but he's interested in other things than, than Hamlet is. Hamlet's a, in, in like perpetual grad school in Wittenberg uh, with Horatio. And in our production, we imagine that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern also are, are at Wittenberg, fellow students. And they're all studying radical philosophy together. And so in order to express the generational divide in a production that was, as a given, a period production. That was kind of a given because it wasn't you that mean long from ago. from Bill, you're saying? Yeah, from Bill, Bill because, yeah. you know, only whatever, four, four years ago? Yeah. Uh, Bill did six, his... 2010. Six, yeah, but did his, his modern dress Hamlet, which was so great, with Dan. And he felt it, we were going to do Hamlet, but we need to do a period production of Hamlet. That was kind of a given. So I was, you know, so I, it wasn't like I was going to do a modern production of Hamlet and, uh, and express the generational divide. So I went to my great friend and one of OSF's, you know, uh, uh, frequent uh, artists, Paul James Prendergast, who's a composer and a sound designer and a genius <laughs> and a friend. And I said to him, can you help me bring the rock and roll to this production? And literally he goes, he, he thought about it for a while and he said, I have an idea. So. What you'll see is there, is there is literally rock and roll in this production. And um, there's a gentleman named Scott Kelly who lives in Ashland. He, is, he works in the sound department on many of the shows here at OSF. It, he also happens to front a band for years called Neurosis, which if you are into heavy metal, he is famous. I just find this so interesting that he lives here in Ashland with his family. He works in as a, he operates the sound. I, kn I know, I remember him operating the sound in, uh, for uh, Othello probably. And, uh, but he also tours the world with neurosis. And I've seen videos of him playing in Paris with shouting crowds. And I saw him play in New York. And so anyway, uh, said, Paul said, let's, let's, uh, let's out him. <laughs> so he presides over the production he, and he plays the grave digger. And he plays, and so the grave digger uh, at, becomes the sort of spirit animal for Hamlet, I guess, and represents inside Hamlet and the part of him that wants to rebel and the part of him that is angry and the part of him that wants to just tear the world down. And, uh, but also that is expressive, that's artistic. Like I, I guess, I guess our, in our production, Hamlet is an, he's a budding artist. If he weren't supposed to be the king, he would have, he would have, he's inventing rock and roll. You know, it's, 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 it's 1601 or whatever, 1599. He's dreaming ahead. He's according to, he's writing in his notebook all the time. 
you know, he's a wannabe playwright. He loves the theater. He loves the players. When they come, he has this feeling like, oh, I know how to do this. I'm going to write you. Can you learn 12 or 16 lines if I can write them for you? So that, the rock and roll aspect comes from the, in my interest in, the gener in expressing the generational divide. And then the, you know, a, a lot of the choices we made had to do with trying to be scary. And that's basically it. And we, I have a great cast. You know, I have a lot of the really, uh, just the, the, me the meaty Shakespearean actors. You know, I have Danforth Cummins is playing Hamlet. Um, Mike, Michael Ellich is playing Claudius. Robin Nordley is playing Gertrude. Derek Lee Whedon is playing Polonius. And he's so good. He's so funny. It's just fantastic. Um, and then I have, a, you know, I have that thing you get here, which is I have incredible actors playing tiny, tiny parts. I have Al Espinoza and Ted Deasy, and uh, you know, I just have a, a remarkable actors. Um, uh, uh, El you know, Elijah, Alexander, playing very small parts. So it's delightful. 